Hello and welcome to Path Breakers with me Neha Bothra. On the show is a very special guest who is also known as the Dean of Valuation. He's one of the greatest professors in the world of finance. I'm talking about Ashwat Damodaran who joins us today from California to talk about valuations and a lot more. Stay tuned. Professor Damodaran, thank you so much for joining us on Path Breakers. Very grateful for your time. You're welcome. Professor, you came to California in 79 from Chennai. Uh, India was a very different place. Chennai was a very different city. How was it coming to California at that time? Culture shock. I mean, it was, it was in fact, you could think of two cities at opposite ends of the spectrum. Chennai and Los Angeles would probably have been those opposite ends. I mean, I went from a city where TV had just come out, what, three years before? And what you watched was I Love Lucy and agricultural shows to to the heart of, you know, entertainment and 24-hour TV. So it was a cultural shock, but I was young and young people adapt and I adapted to the new circumstances. And you decided to study finance. I actually did my MBA and I had no intentions. At that time, I had no, des- I, mean, I had no long-term plans. I thought a year ahead and essentially said, I'm going to get my MBA and then we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. What led you to actually pursue a career in teaching? I mean, at that time, investment banking boom had just started. I think you too were headed towards a career in investment banking. What made you rethink your decision? It shows you how the big decisions in your life are often made on accident because it was actually this, I think the very last quarter of my MBA program, I think I had a job lined up at an investment bank. And as you said, it had been on the ground floor of what was then going to be a huge growth business. And I needed money because I was I was running out of cash. So I agreed to be a teaching assistant in an accounting class. I don't even like accounting. And I walked into that first session and 15 minutes in, I knew that this was what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I tell people, look, there are moments in your life where you get, I, I, I'm not even sure how to describe them, but messages from God saying, this is what you were meant to do. I'm not saying I'm a vessel for religious messages, but I knew then that this was what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So after that session was done, I walked up to the finance department. Now, as I looked across all of the different classes I'd taken, finance seemed to be the most interesting, the most fun. I walked up to the finance department and said, I'd like to do a PhD because that was the entry to being a teacher in finance. I'm not a professor. I'm not a researcher. I'm a teacher first and foremost. And that was my entry point to teaching. Mm-hmm. That's very profound. And the fact that you stuck to it for four decades and more. Uh, in the interim, you never wanted to explore uh, a career in asset management. Uh, you are the guru of valuation. And is that a thought that never crossed your mind? I think even if you, even if you take a first level economics class, you're told the objective in your life is to maximize utility. It's not to maximize wealth. It's not to maximize income. It's to maximize the happiness you feel over the course of your life. I have a job I love. I don't even describe it as a job. I have a passion that happens to be my job. There is no day that I wake up and say, I wish I didn't have to teach today. When you have something that truly brings together your passion and your livelihood, why would you ever want to go explore something else? I mean, and I, you know, let's let's be quite clear. I, I haven't sacrificed anything along the way. I have everything I need. I might not have everything I want, but who does? Now, nobody does. I have everything I need. And could I get more? Yes. What am I going to use it for? So from that perspective, I've never been tempted to be anything other than what I am, which is a teacher. I've never consulted a day in my life. I don't do expert witness work. I don't serve on boards of directors. I essentially don't do any of those things because, you know, I don't see the need to. I, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I don't have to do those things. I'm not looking down on the people who do it. But for me, teaching is front and center what I do. Professor, having interacted with your students, I do know that you are so loved and so respected by thousands of students you've taught over the years. In fact, they tell me stories about how they ambush you outside the class, at the gym, just to get more from you. Why is it that students are able to really connect with you the way you teach a subject like valuation, which wasn't even there until 1986, I think? 
I think it's you know, when I set out in a class, I don't set out to kind of instill what I know in other people because that's going to pass. I want people to get a window into how I think through problems. Because remember the old saying that you want to teach people how to fish rather than give them fish. The objective in teaching is to give people a sense of how you think. So if I have changed the way people think, that to me is the biggest contribution I can make as a teacher. So I hope I make people curious I, because I think human beings instinctively want to learn. I truly believe that. Hopefully they rediscover that in my class and they can go out and find their own curiosities and come up with their own solutions. I think the most exciting part, especially in the classes I teach, is I have 50,000 live case studies out there. Every publicly traded company is a case study, a case study because you can value the company and there's a market price today. So it's fascinating for me to value a company in real time and see how it plays out. It does mean that in hindsight, you could be wrong. I mean, I valued NVIDIA a few weeks ago. I came up with $410 per share. Today, it's trading at 500. I'm getting emails from people saying, what did you get wrong? I am not upset or worried by that because I think the exciting part of doing this is having it happen in real time and see how the market evolves over time. So it, it, it I think, adds to the excitement. So I'd rather look at things happening rather than things that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. And luckily I teach in a discipline where I'm able to do that in real time. The current world is very volatile and of course uncertainty is a feature of investment, but how do you look at valuation in current times? Uh, there is so much data to analyze and there's a lot of information available, but how do you join the dots to come up with a valuation that is sustainable considering the kind of disruption we keep seeing? I, you know, I'm going to push back on the notion that we live at a time of extreme uncertainty. Do we? Do you think the people who came out of the Second World War faced less uncertain times than we do? Or the invention of the automobile and how it changed the way people live or electricity or the, the original factory system? I don't think we live in special times. Each generation likes to think it's special. You know why we feel that we're in more uncertain times? Because everybody's prom becomes everybody else's prom. Over the last weekend, we had a hurricane, or at least rumors that we're going to have a hurricane in Southern California, where I live. And I received calls from my family in India saying, you know, are you OK? You know, we heard about the hurricane. In 1981, if there'd been a hurricane in Calcutta, forget about Southern California, you probably wouldn't read about it in Chennai till, what, three days after the cyclone hit? So I think one of the reasons we feel more uncertain is we're inundated with information and everything happening in real time, not just around us, but around the world. And I think that's making us very uncomfortable because as human beings, uncertainty makes us uncomfortable. So in a strange and contradictory way, our access to data is actually making us more susceptible to doing emotional things because we now feel we're more surrounded by uncertainty. And when you do, you behave in unhealthy ways. So when you look at a company today and you try and come up with a valuation for that company, how do you go about it? See, first, I think you need to look at the uncertainties you face and organize them. Not all uncertainties are created equal. I believe in putting uncertainties in buckets so you have a sense of what's going into which bucket. So it'll keep you from getting overwhelmed. I mean, I tell people, look, if you make a list of everything you're uncertain about when you value a company, it's going to run to hundreds of items. You're going to feel overwhelmed. Organizing it is the first step. Second, recognize that the nature of the uncertainties you face will be very different depending on the company you value. When I valued Zomato, the kinds of uncertainties I faced were very different than when I value Asian paints, or when I value Grasm, or when I value you know, uh, ITC. As companies age, the kinds of uncertainties you face will, will vary. Second, once you've decided which uncertainties are the big ones with this company, Face up to the uncertainty. Don't hide from it. Don't go into denial. And facing up to the uncertainty means figuring out how uncertain you are and actually incorporating it into your analysis. I mean, I do what I call simulations and valuations. So rather than valuing a company with point estimates, revenue growth is going to be 23%. Margins are going to be 15%. You build distributions around your assumptions and you come up with distributions of value. It's a much more honest way of saying, look, I can give you a value for a company 
but I'm going to be wrong. Why? Not because I haven't done my homework, but because I'm not God. Essentially, you're going to be uncertain because you don't control what the future will deliver. And I think facing up to it gives you a much better chance of dealing with it. And my final advice when you face uncertainty is keep it simple. Don't have hundreds of line items because, again, you'll get overwhelmed. Less is more. And I think that message more than anything else has stood me in good stead when I think about valuing companies where there's a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You often talk about how pricing is different from valuation. And you talk about the role that narratives play, the role that storytelling plays when you talk about valuation. Can you tell us a bit about that? Now, let's first take the contrast between pricing and value. Right? Pricing essentially is a very simple process. You decide how much to pay for something by looking at what other people are paying for similar things. So let's say you wanted to buy the Chennai Super Kings. Why? Because you're a billionaire. You want to have an IPL team as your trophy asset. You know how you're going to decide how much to pay for it? You're going to look at what somebody paid for another IPL team or maybe another professional sports franchise. And you say, hey, they paid a billion dollars. I'll pay a billion dollars as well. That's pricing. In pricing, you attach a number to an asset based on what other people are paying for similar assets. It's how we decide how much to pay for a house or an apartment. Pricing is intuitive. We all do it. Valuation, on the other hand, requires that you understand a business. So if you want to buy the Chennai Super Kings as a business, you got to understand how they make money, how much money they make from the stadiums, how much money they make from media, and essentially think about how much you will pay for the business you're buying. It's more work, but your assessment then drives your decision. Most people price things. They don't value them. They like to use the word value when in fact they're pricing things. Mm -hmm. And how does the role of narratives come in? I think a lot of people, when they think about valuing a company, think about inputs. What's my revenue growth? What are my margins? They think about numbers. But those numbers reflect a story you're telling about the company. Ultimately, what keeps those numbers held together, what keeps them consistent is the underlying story. So if you go back and look at my Zomato valuation, you can agree with it or disagree with it. It's not about what I'm using as revenue growth and margins that's giving me the value. It's my story of Zomato as a restaurant food delivery business that's going to feed off the growth of that business in an immense market like India. That's the story that's driving it. Now, you could tell a different story about Zomato. You might say, look, it's not a restaurant food delivery business. It is a grocery delivery business in addition. That changes the story. It changes your inputs. Will it make the value higher? Maybe it will. Maybe it will not. But it's a different story. I tell people, look, when you build a spreadsheet, think about the underlying story you're telling. Because even if you say, I have no story, your numbers convey a story. And you got to believe in that story. Mm -hmm. So last year, you had a fair value of 35 per share for Zomato. Has that changed? I think that, you know, I haven't revisited the valuation. I think they've done some things better, some things worse. But I think the price is going to go up and down till you get to some steady state here. It remains still predominantly a restaurant food delivery business. I don't think the facts on the ground have changed that much. So if there's a tilt in the value. It's got to come from risk premiums changing, maybe a higher base number. I don't see the value dramatically shifting, even though I haven't done the full-fledged valuation, because I don't see a shift in the story. And that's, I think, the key. Unless the story shifts, your value is not going to change dramatically. What could cause my story to shift? Well, if the model shows evidence that it can actually make money on grocery deliveries, that's a huge business. Then I'd be inclined to go back and revisit my story and valuation. I'm not stuck on my story and valuation. In fact, one of the biggest dangers in investing is falling in love with your own story for a company, in which case you refuse to look at the data because the data might contradict your story. I try, and that's all you can do, to try not to fall in love with the stories I tell for my companies, because unless you keep that feedback loop open, unless you're willing to change your story, you're going to be locked into decisions you shouldn't be locked into. Mm -hmm. Professor, in India at least, we've seen many of these new age tech startups that have seen a massive erosion in terms of their valuation after they listed on stock exchanges. What explains that? Is it because they haven't been able to keep up with the projected growth momentum? It's a loss of confidence. What do you think has changed in the story for the valuations to come up 50-60% from listing? 
I think one of the dangers of using case studies sometimes is you think that, so if I use the Amazon case study, you're saying, oh, this is great. Every, everybody should do, do this. We forget how many companies like Amazon in 1997 never made it to 2001 or 2002. For young companies to make it, lots of pieces have to fall into place. So when people accuse me when I valued as a motto of being too pessimistic, I what I think they're missing is how many things have to work out for a young company to become a large successful company. I mean, I was awfully wrong on Paytm. And you can see what happens when you tell a story and management is incapable of delivering on that story, what can happen to your value? So I think that with young companies, I tell people, you're going to be wrong 100% of the time because things will always happen that are out of your control. And only a few of these companies will come out of the other end as these superstars, these 10 baggers, 100 baggers that become legendary investments. Mm -hmm. Did it also have to do with um, unfounded optimism? Very often we've seen venture capital firms actually come out with valuations, which they say is based on a potential market size. How do you explain that? I'm going to do something that bugs students in my class. Whenever they use the word valuation in a context where I think it should not be used, I step in and say, do you mean pricing? Venture <laughs> capitalists don't value companies. They're incapable of valuing companies. They price them. They price them based on what? Based on total addressable markets, number of users, number of subscribers. I understand why they do what they do, but remember it's a pricing game, which means the game does well when the momentum is with you. But when the momentum shifts, guess what? The price adjusts as well. So VCs are traders, they're not investors. They trade on companies and a successful VC is one who times a drag, times entry and exit drag. So I would not shed any tears for VCs who lose money when momentum goes against them because they make money when momentum is in their favor. But I don't expect VCs to have deep thoughts about businesses because they're interested in whatever metric will allow them to flip the company to other people at a higher price. AI is a big theme that has got the fancy of money managers and investors alike. How do you see this playing out? Do you think that investors are putting too much weight on this? Are they overestimating the returns they can get from artificial intelligence? And what is the potential downside of this? And I think in a sense, what you know, it is true that AI is the mood of the moment. And I do believe that AI is the capacity to change the way we live. I mean, that one of the questions I ask about these, these buzzwords when they show up is, is this a word that can change the way we live? I didn't feel that about the metaverse. When I thought about the metaverse, I thought about 25 year olds with virtual reality glasses, and I, I could not relate. I did not feel that way about the cloud business. But if you look at during my lifetime, the four big changes that have changed the way we live and work, the first mm -hmm. was personal computers in the 1980s. The second was online, you know, the internet in the 1990s and following through. The third was social media. And with each of these recognized, wasn't just businesses, change the way we lived, to change the way we all work. I think AI has the potential to change the way we live and work. So that's the good news. The bad news is if you take those three big trends I talked about, PCs, the, the dot-com boom, or the internet and social media, and you think about who were the winners that came out of this game? First, re remember, there are relatively few winners from this game. So if you look at the PC business, almost none of the original PC companies ended up as winners. Mm -hmm. Dell, Compaq, all faded away. In fact, the biggest winner from the PC business is a company that supplies software to PCs, which is Microsoft. You look at online, the big winner, of course, is Amazon. But there were companies that provided the infrastructure for the online revolution. Cisco. It peaked in 2000 and then it, you know, it kind of faded down to becoming a large and successful company. The big winners of social media have been Facebook, Google. You know. So you can see that each, bis each of these big movements has created a few big winners. So I can understand why you know, mutual funds and investors are excited. They want to find the next big winner. But here's the thing that needs to be kept in mind. Most of the rest of the world did not gain, did not become more profitable. I mean, take in the internet. It destroyed a lot of businesses. It had a few big winners, but the rest of the world actually emerged as less profitable because 
of the dot-com retailing revolution. I'll make the same prediction about AI. AI will create some winners. NVIDIA right now has been anointed as one of the winners. Microsoft has been anointed as one of the winners. And maybe they will end up as the winners when this game is played through. But the rest of the world, I don't see how this is going to make a retail business or a grocery business more profitable. Kroger's, which is a grocery chain, you know, the, the last earnings report talked about AI eight times during an earnings call. I failed to see how bringing AI into the grocery business is going to make it more profitable. I know there are stories about how to reduce costs, but I was saying if everybody has it, nobody has it. If every grocery chain has AI, guess what's going to happen? Costs are going to come down across the board, but so will prices and so will margins. So 10 years from now, when we look back at AI, even if it succeeded as a major movement, I'll predict you're going to find maybe a handful of winners, a lot of wannabes, companies that tried to get on but never quite made it. Most of them will end up spending money. They will pay a lot of consultants, a lot of advisors for these AI tools, but they'll have nothing to show for it. A lot of people are going to get rich on AI. Right? But they're going to be consultants, advisors, suppliers of services that will make that they will claim will make you better. So I, you know, you can predict because you've seen it happen with the other booms. It is predictable. I understand why companies will do it, but I'll also make the prediction for most of them, the payoff is going to be negative. Mm -hmm. There's also the debt overhang many of these companies have on the balance sheet. Uh, this is a very traditional problem that uh, Indian family businesses have been going through. What's the end game? I, I, you know, sometimes people running companies have to choose whether they value control or whether they value a healthy company. And sometimes the two are mutually exclusive. There are some family groups in India that value control so much that they've refused to issue equity, not because they cannot, but the issuing of equity they feel will dilute their ownership and control of the company and chosen to borrow money. It's a choice. And it's a choice that is double, you know, it's double edged. In good times, debt helps you. In bad times, it works against you. So healthy family group companies understand that issuing equity is not a bad thing to do. Giving up a little control to have a healthier company to me strikes me as, as a good trade off. But it's not an easy one for families that value control so much that they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of this, inflation is a big concern and uh, interest rates are also going up to tackle inflation. How are you looking at these things in terms of how they will impact businesses and investors alike? Because we don't seem to be going back to the earlier decade where we saw a lot of easy money. We are reverting to normal again. How will we adjust? There will be a bit of pain along the road. One of the few advantages of getting older is you remember times when inflation was 7 8%, when interest rates were 9%, when mortgage rates were 10%. So when people look at rates now and say, oh my God, I've never seen something like this before. They're giving away their age. I mean, for 20 years, we've been lazy. I mean, people forget that the last decade in particular is perhaps one of the most unusual decades in economic history, a period where inflation was not just low, but predictable, and people got lazy. So guess what? This is just a wake up call saying, you know, you thought inflation had been conquered, it's back again. This is a reversal back to things that people used to do that they stopped doing because it wasn't a problem anymore. So I think people who took interest rates for granted, inflation for granted, did not explicitly factor that into their contracts, into the way they do business are going to get a wake up call. So that's why I think, you know, P, you know, managers in Turkey might be in better shape than managers in the US or Europe because Turkey's had inflation for the last decade. For them it's never been a problem that went away. You know, and and there are some Indian managers, younger managers who forget there were periods when inflation was double digits in India when interest rates were much higher. And sometimes it just takes a little getting used to. So there's going to be an adjustment period for managers who are not used to dealing with higher inflation and more volatile inflation. Mm -hmm. How do you see this panning out for emerging markets in particular? I think emerging markets are a mixed bag, right? I mean, Brazil is very different from India, is very different from China. So you almost have to name the emerging market. I don't think there's a collective statement you can make about emerging markets. Emerging markets that keep inflation in check are in much better shape than emerging markets that don't. So I would argue that we need to start to stop bunching countries together. And this is true, not just for emerging markets, but developed markets 
and start separating countries that are being run sensibly from countries where you you know the bill is going to come due. So I think um, you know uh, rather than bunch India with a bunch of other emerging markets with very different issues and problems, I think India has to think about what its specific problems are and what policies might be needed to kind of deal with those problems. Do you think that India stands better uh, when compared to emerging market peers? I, I mean, I, and I think that 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 is the consensus right now, right? If you look at the last two years, if you looked across emerging markets, India has, has been one of the winners because it's had a combination of healthy economic growth, lower than it might have been, but still healthy, and inflation that's not out of control. So so far, India has pulled the trump cards out of their um, out of the card deck. They've they've got a good hand. But remember, you can play a good hand badly. So the game is not over. I think, you know, you can't settle on your on what's been done well. I think you need to keep working at keeping inflation under control and keeping economic growth at a healthy number. The danger for India is that it shouldn't overreach. I mean, what, what do I mean by overreach? I mean, I hear people saying India should be the next China. They need to go for double digit growth. Sometimes I think settling for a lesser growth rate, but making sure that that growth is delivered in a more healthy way is better than going for the double digit growth and overreaching. Because you're seeing the consequences of overreach in China, because some of the hangover that China is going through is because the government got caught up in we need to keep double digit growth at all costs. Guess what? All costs is a dangerous word because the costs you bear can be more than you can really deal with in the long term. We have a bunch of advantages. Uh, one is the digital infrastructure that is in place, which is one of the best in the world. We have a young population, which is a big advantage as well. Don't forget the biggest <laughs> advantage, right? If yes. India had 20 million people rather than a billion and a you know, billion three or whatever the updated number is, we wouldn't be talking about India as a success story. I mean, this is a big market. It, it's a growing market. And so you can see why there's so much excitement about the India story. And I think fundamentally, the India story is a, is a really positive one. And that's why I said the danger here is overreach, which is you start to make the story too big. Then you overreach, you try to do things you shouldn't be doing. But I think India should also be aware of its weaknesses. I mean, the, the weaknesses are still in infrastructure. India still is a country that lacks the infrastructure to sustain the growth it wants to deliver. And that means that sometimes settling for a slower and steadier pathway to being a successful company might end up being the better strategy. China, of course, is going through a period of economic upheaval. Do you think India has a sustainable advantage over China, which can play out meaningfully over the next two to five years? I think for 20 years, we've had this contest between a democracy and an authoritarian regime and asked businesses, which one would you rather operate in? Mm -hmm. And for the last two decades, businesses have chosen China and authoritarian because the rules are set. They said, look, India, things change all the time. It's the nature of democracies, right? Things change all the time. Rules change, regulations change. China, it's predictable. It's easier to run a business. But the dark side of operating in a regime where a government basically sets the rules and there is no challenge, legal or political, to that view, is that governments can be, can be capricious. The government that's on your side today can become your enemy tomorrow. And this is not just foreign companies. Take a look at what's happened to the big Chinese tech companies, Alibaba, Tencent, where the government was viewed as an ally mm -hmm. for the longest time. But Beijing mm -hmm. said, no, guys, you're not our allies anymore. They lost you know, basically 60, 70, 80 percent of value and their pathway to being trillion dollar companies. So I think that businesses are recognizing, at least in the last two or three years, the downside of being an authority. So this is a moment for India, right? They can actually repackage the, the chaos that goes with being a democracy as chaos that's actually good for business in the long term because it's risk that's continuous, risk that you can deal with, risk that you can manage, rather than this discontinuous risk that, that comes from dealing with an authoritarian government. So I think for the moment, at least, the balance seems to have shifted towards India on that basis. It's not permanent. You know, you're always going to have, you know, three steps forward, two steps back. But at the moment, I think India does have an advantage over China 
because of its political system. And that's not been true for much of the last two decades. Professor Damodaran, you've seen markets go through boom and bust. What are your key learnings? I think the lesson I've learned is my motivations have to be internal. They can't be external. As long as I look outwards to experts, to specialists for my for my for what I should be doing, I'm going to be pulled back and forth. I need to internalize what I know. And I tell people, and this is going to be very strange advice, we read too much now. We think too little. I think we need to start to go back and think about questions and answers and try to reason our way through. And if it's the one lesson I can take away from this is as long as I'm comfortable with my own decisions, it doesn't matter to me what other people think about my decisions. It's not their problem, it's mine. What have markets taught you as an investor? That the markets are bigger than any of us. So in markets, you know, people talk about, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, telling you what the market's doing. I, I think that in a sense, we've got to recognize that markets are, you know, if you think about markets, that the market is essentially a consensus of the entire, I mean, millions and millions of investors coming together. So it's an, it's an amazing instrument for delivering that consensus message. And I think that if, if nothing else, I tell people, look, I can disagree with markets. I can think they're wrong, but I should always respect markets. And I always do. So when you're too quick to jump to the conclusion, the market has gone crazy, the market is wrong. I think you're missing a chance to step back and say, what is the market seeing that I'm not seeing? Professor Damodaran, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your views and insights on Pathbreakers. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's all we have time for on this edition of Pathbreakers. Many thanks for watching. Goodbye.